Good afternoon, everyone, um, and a very warm welcome to the Inspire Europe Plus webinar on publication strategies for researchers at risk. I will give a brief introduction to the project, first of all, um, and the, we will then cover some housekeeping rules before I hand over to our three key speakers for today. So the Inspire Europe Plus project gets its name from the initiative to support, promote and integrate researchers at risk in Europe and runs until August 2025. It is coordinated by Scholars at Risk Europe, who are hosted by Maynooth University in Ireland. And Scholars at Risk Europe are the EU organization of the Global Scholars at Risk organization. Inspire Europe Plus is an EU funded project involving seven partners across Europe, including Scholars at Risk Europe, Maynooth, at Maynooth University in Ireland, the French National Pause Programme, which is hosted by Collège de France, the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, the European Univers University Association, the Alexander von Humboldt F Foundation in Germany, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and the Council for At-Risk Academics in the UK. There are also three associated partners, including the Global Scholars at Risk Network based in New York, the Scholar Rescue Fund European branch, and the Conference of Rectors of Spanish Universities. The project and partners aim is to strengthen and coordinate support in Europe for researchers at risk. Building on the work undertaken by the Inspire Europe project, which ran from 2019 through 2022, Inspire Europe Plus uh, proceeds from the view that excellence in research depends upon free and open scientific debate and requires diversity of perspectives and methodology, methodologies to flourish. Yet challenges to academic freedom and related pressures on individual researchers remain significant globally. In many countries and regions, researchers face, face risks to their life, liberty and research careers. When researchers are at risk and excluded from participating in the global research circuit, whether due to discrimination, persecution, disaster or violence, not only are individual lives and careers at risk, the very future of research is also at stake. Therefore, in recognition of a shared commitment to excellence in research and to the principles of freedom of inquiry and academic freedom that are essential for world-class research, the Inspire Europe Plus partners will coordinate activities across Europe to support researchers at risk through 2025. This includes direct guidance through webinars and trainings such as this one today, building institutional capacity and preparedness for support, advising national level initiatives, informing European policy, and raising awareness to diversify support for researchers at risk in Europe. I'm delighted to be joined by three excellent speakers today who have a lot of experience within the topic of publication strategies. Firstly, Professor David Neal is Senior Vice, Senior Vice President for Global Research at Elsevier Publishing where he leads the Research Collaboration Unit and is also responsible for the International Center for the Study of Research. David has over 38 years of academic experience and is a Professor Emeritus in Surgical Oncology at both Oxford and, Univ and Cambridge University. David has done a lot of work with Ukrainian researchers at risk over the past year and we'll be discuss discussing this in more detail. Dr. Harry Shirley is Editorial Development Manager at Nature Portfolio and conducts the Nature Research Academy's training workshops. He has a decade of experience as an academic researcher and gained his doctorate in chemistry from Queen Mary University of London and then worked in world leading research groups in Auckland, New Zealand and Oxford, UK. Since leaving academia in 2018, Harry has gained extensive experience conducting academic training workshops worldwide. And Dr. Wafa Kashbaum is a clinic, clinical lecturer in restorative dentistry at the University of Manchester and an author at Cochrane Oral Health. 
Wafa completed her PhD in dentistry at Newcastle University and her Masters of Dental Science at the University of Glasgow. Just a few housekeeping rules before I hand over to our first speaker for the day. Um, the chat function for attendees has been disabled, um, uh, but there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, questions for this can be raised using the Q&A button, which you will find at the bottom of your screens. Please do ensure that if you do not want to wish your name to be seen, please ensure that you click the submit anonymously button before submitting any of your questions. And finally, we will be sending a short survey following the webinar, uh, which we'll be most grateful if you could complete. I will now hand over to Professor David Neal, um, who's our first speaker for the day. For the day. Um, so the floor is yours, David. I ask if my screen is visible to everybody. Yeah, we can see it. That's great. Okay. Well, I, thank you very much, Lucia, and I. I'll be acknowledging the um, help that Cara gave me actually as we started to put together this program um, earlier in the year. Yes, yeah, so my name is David Neal and I currently work at Elsevier and I, I'm going to describe today the program of, of work that we put together and emphasizing actually the need to really work with the people uh, that you're trying to support. I think that was the main message because um, some ideas that we had maybe didn't resonate or land very well. So I, I probably can go through these first slides very quickly, um, but really just to go through the history, I was, I was for instance, I was in Berlin uh, two weeks ago and you can still see the impact of the refugees from Ukraine in Berlin, even though they are being looked after very well there. There's, there's huge numbers of refugees in, in Germany and in other countries, Poland as well, Czechia, Moldova, and so on. Um, many researchers left the country and because of the military call-up, uh, many of these were female or, or older male researchers. When this happened, um, there was obviously natural human concern within, within, within any company and within any country when you see this happening. And so we formed a small group at Elsevier to try and determine what we could do to try and support those academics who had been displaced from the Ukraine. We were particularly focused on that group. Um, we did have some ideas, but uh, we were wanting to ensure that we were offering the right thing, the thing that was most used to people, and took advice from a number of different groups. And uh, some of them have been mentioned already. We, we talked to Lucia and colleagues at CARA. I talked to people in Maynooth as well. Um, and in particular, we reached out to the National Academy of Sciences in Poland. I had some personal links there. And in, it, as you'll see a bit later on, we ended up focusing our efforts uh, to support people in Poland. Um, largely because we had those close interactions. We reached out to a number of groups. We were put in touch with a really vibrant group of early career researchers called the Young Scientists Council of Ukraine, who then introduced me to the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. And through some personal contacts I made, we had discussions with some individual researchers who left the country and who were settled in a number of different Country, uh, universities in Poland, and we also managed to speak to um, two or three people in charge of international relations. And then because of our uh, publishing network, we had access to around 30,000 people whose emails we had, either they were editors or they were authors uh, who'd, who'd been working with Elsevier. So, um, these were some early responses that we made, which actually were not really specific to publishing or academia, but um, you can see here that there was an early response from our parent company at Relex. Um, people wanted to help us. You know, we were seen 
In the Netherlands, for instance, again, where quite a lot of people ended up going, there was some the company matched any donations that were being given by individuals. Um, and you can see that the sort of things that we did uh, early on. But the more significant thing is we worked with the National Academy of Sciences in Poland, and we wanted to know if a donation would help. Would, would some cash actually help people who had moved to Poland? And indeed, um, that, was, that offer was gratefully accepted. And we continue to work with the National Academy, who are about to announce, um, I hope I'm not... <laughs> letting out secrets here, but they're about to announce a major program of significant funding for displaced academics who the senior investigator will be in Poland, but there may be colleagues still in the Ukraine. And this will be a, a, a funded program lasting three years to try and support people who have been displaced from Ukraine, but nevertheless may wish to go back in due course. Um, we the most, probably the most useful thing was working with the Young Scientist Council of Ukraine, to be honest, where we got strong feedback, and they indicated that they wanted training, um, and perhaps Harry will come on to this in a moment later on. But they wanted access to what we call research academy. We have lectures and webinars for things like research integrity, how to publish, how to edit, and so on and so forth. And we they said they really would like access to some of our databases, Science Direct being where we hold most of our publications, Scopus, which is useful for finding colleagues out, out of the Ukraine. I mean, the particular feedback we got was, you know, we're in a very disturbed situation. We want some normality. We want to reach out to some colleagues who are in France or in the UK or in the US where I can, I can have a mentor, or I can talk to somebody. So that's one thing that we picked up. And then some other um, things that were specific to our clinical resource that we, we supplied these free to um, medical academics in Ukraine. Uh, we actually did have to provide some secure method of contacting them uh, as well, actually, because so that these couldn't be traced um, given the situation of where they were working. So we, we issued ad personam tokens. Uh, we then set up a mentorship program for editors of Ukrainian journals. Um, this is a brief thing about the resource page we set up. This is the link um, you can see. And this is what we managed to achieve. We contacted over 30,000 people. Um, we got about a 6% click-through rate, which is quite a high rate actually for what we can call marketing. We got around 3,000 people who registered on the website. And you can see that the numbers that in August, 100,000 downloads of articles from Science Direct have been made, averaging around 65 downloads per registrant. Um, so the, this, is, this is the sort of outcome that we had. Uh, we also, I should say, apart from using our own email contacts, to offer access to those free resources. We actually did ask um, the National Academy of Sciences in Poland, the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine, and the Young Scientist Council of Ukraine to send around a, a letter which we prepared, which had an individualized link so that people could register um, to, to get access to these various resources. And these have been well used, I think, and you can see what happened over a three month period. Um, Scopus is our largely um, it's a search engine to identify abstracts that was highly used. The usage has dropped um, over these three months periods, which is really interesting. There was a very high take up in August when we set it up. And as you can see, the figures are this was sort of stabilizing around 15,000 um, accesses per month. And we are carrying on this initiative for another year. And we've actually extended um, the access to Cyval because some of the, we got a list of 10 universities in the Ukraine who wanted to benchmark their activities against peers in Central Europe. 
So the the formal, well, uh, two other brief things I want to discuss, Lucia, really now. One of them was a workshop that we did in Warsaw. And I, in, as far as this is concerned, I really want to acknowledge the help that I had from my STMJ colleagues in Elsevier. They put this together. We have a team of people, probably like Harry does for Springer Nature, to provide training. So we put together a workshop in Warsaw um, that you can see here. It was a two-week program, 12 days in Warsaw, and it was largely around how to improve the editing and publishing process for those journals um, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, the YSCU here is the Young Scientist Council of Ukraine, provided some names, and you can see we were trying to support them in improving their journal performance, including you know, how to internationalize a journal, ethics and handling difficult situations. And again, I can scan over this really very quickly. Um, these are just the names. The, there are no names of Ukrainian colleagues here. These are internal colleagues in Elsevier who put together this two-day program in October. And you can see the sort of things that were covered uh, in training some editors in, in, in Elsevier. And finally, I want to just uh, probably cover something that you'll be familiar with, Lucia and Harry, um, which is another way that publishers are supporting not just what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, we are uh, very aware that in a way, um, this has been going on for many decades. And CARA, of course, has a history of being set up in the 1930s to deal with an exodus of Jewish, particularly Jewish academics leaving Germany at that time. So this is a continuing program. And we are, we are aware that that's the case. And we've learned a lot from doing this with Ukraine. Research for Life, as you can see, um, provides quite a bit of support to a number of different countries, some of whom um, are not subject to conflict and the sort of things that Lucia was talking about, but are subject to you know, low, match, no, low uh, GDPs and often require or often wish for additional support. So that you can see a number of uh, quotes here that what Research for Life does. And I could go into more detail about which countries are covered, but uh, we are relatively short of time. But you can see here that a number of countries are covered either as Group A, where resources applied are supplied by Research for Life without charge, and then a number of other countries that have relatively low GDPs or are subject to global violence, where they have reduced charges for a number of different products that Research for Life covers. And this has been working for about two decades. So in summary, <clears throat> um, I would say that you know there was a strong internal pull from people in the company who wanted to do something. Um, I'd emphasize that working with those academic colleagues who were displaced was really critical to me in finding the best solutions to our, not to argue with, but to champion within the company to ensure that we got the right resources. Uh, we did provide donations, um, but actually it was the provision of the pro bono products that were really most appreciated. And we're continuing to support and review things regularly. Um, the internal lessons I think that I've escalated to the senior management in the company is that we should be prepared to help in the future because these things will happen in the future, history tells us. And we've learned from that, we've documented how we've gone about it to reduce some of the um, uh, bottlenecks, wrong word, but maybe the friction that there was internally in the company and just getting things moving um, from different parts of the company. And we've learned a lot from that, how to bring people together to try and deliver these solutions that people really wanted to do to help. So that, that's me, Lucia. I hope that's around 15 minutes. No, that's great. Um, thank you, David, for sharing that. Um, 
it's great to see the work that Elsevier is obviously doing um, for Ukrainian research at risk and then with the research for life on a more broader scale. Um, do you think that in the future, now that you've developed something for Ukrainian research at risk, that you may be able to take this model um, and help other researchers at risk outside of um, Ukrainians? Is that the hope moving forward? We've set up, we'll you know, review particular situations. I mean, I, I think the feedback we had, you know, was that, you know, you look at what happened in Afghanistan or in Syria, these were similar situations. And whilst we've done, we have, you know, done things there, I think that the lessons I've learned from this is that, you know, there are particular things that would be really useful to those sort of urgent things that come up. So I would hope you know, that we would look at that and be able to do something for, for those situations. That's great. Thank you, David. Um, we will be asking David more questions at the end during the Q&A section. Um, but for now, we'll move on to Harry. Um, so Harry, all yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, yeah, I think I should be sharing my screen now. So thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure to have the chance to speak to our brilliant audience today. I'm Harry, I work for Nature Research Academies. Now, part of my role within Nature Research is developing and delivering training workshops for researchers. Really through my role, I want to help researchers in various different aspects of their career whether that's formulating manuscripts for submission, navigating the peer review process, applying for research positions, or indeed applying for grants. We have a wide range of different training workshops. If you are interested in learning more about Nature Research Academies, simply Google our name and you'll be able to find our web page. So today I wanted to give you a brief session related to effective writing strategies. So when we write our manuscript and we publish our work, why do we do all of this? Why do we spend all of this time communicating our study? Well, one of our motivations when we publish our work should be simply you want to share your new information. You want to share your findings with other researchers. That's what it's all about. That's why we publish. So what's important then is that, of course, other researchers can understand our new information. And that's what I want to guide you through today. I want to provide you with some simple tools and techniques you can use when writing your manuscript to ensure that other researchers understand the information that you're presenting to them. The first thing I want to touch on today is simply the importance of using concise and simple language when creating your manuscript. Now, some of you might be saying, why is this important? Why does it matter if my writing is concise and simple? Researchers will be able to understand what I'm saying, surely. Well, no, we need to be very mindful about how we formulate our sentences. And this relates to cognitive load theory. Some of you may have heard of this before. This is an area of psychology it became very prominent in the 1980s. What did psychologists actually find? Well, it may not be a surprise to everybody, but the mind has limited processing capacity. The human mind can only process and recall and remember so much new information at any given time. We're not robots, we're not machines. Therefore, we need to be mindful when explaining new information. And this has been shown in a number of studies. Yes, this study is very old, but these kinds of study have been replicated again and again. In this study, we 
see that these researchers have compared the word length of sentences with the amount of information that could be recalled. Notice when we have short sentences between 10 and 20 words, we can recall a large amount of the information, 98%. But what happens as our sentences become longer? The amount of information participants can recall is drastically decreased. We need our readers to remember our information so that they can learn, so that they can apply our new information. Therefore, essentially, we can help advance our research field. So my recommendation for researchers in general is to have sentences between 10 and 20 words on average. Not every sentence the same length. We do still want variety, some shorter, some longer, but on average, 10 to 20. Variety is still very important in academic writing. Imagine a guitarist playing the same note again and again and again. It would be very boring. So a variety of sentence lengths, but as I say, on average, between 10 and 20 words. Related to cognitive load theory, again, my guidance is to simply introduce one idea per sentence. For this reason, I do recommend avoiding semicolons. Often, a sentence that has a semicolon can simply be split into two sentences as well. So some of you might be thinking, Harry, this is not easy. I agree. When explaining complex scientific ideas, it is very challenging to keep our sentences concise. But there's one thing we can do, and that's avoid unnecessary words. Look at every sentence that you've written and ask yourself, can I delete any words here? If there are some words that you can remove without changing the meaning of the sentence, simply delete those words. Let me give you some examples. As a matter of fact, we found higher levels of expression of, are there any words here that really hold no value? Of course, as a matter of fact. If something's a fact, we can just say it. We don't need to say this phrase, and that's five words we can remove to make our sentence more concise. It is worth mentioning that. Again, an unnecessary phrase. If we remove these phrases, we don't change the meaning of the sentence, but we make the sentence more concise. That is another reason why we believe, again, unnecessary. Instead of using this long phrase of five words, replace it with one word, therefore. So try and avoid using these long phrases as they detract from the important information in your writing. Here's a list of a number of other phrases you might want to avoid in your own writing. Instead of, it is clear that, clearly, it is possible that, possibly, okay? So do look at all of the sentences once you've written your manuscript and try and cut down on all of these unnecessary words by scribbling them off. So scientific writing, it's very important that we're concise. But also, it's very important that we're specific. What do I mean by specific in this context? Well, I recommend that you're very mindful about the language you choose to use. Let me give you an example of some problematic words that researchers sometimes use in their writing that can actually be a problematic example. Do be careful using pronouns. These can be unclear subjects. Of course, we all know what pronouns are. This, that, those, they, it. How can these be problematic? Let's have a look at an example. The study by Robins et al. randomly allocated 320 and 331 participants into the experimental and control groups respectively. 
They were then blinded as to whom received each intervention. Can anybody see anything that's problematic here? Of course. Who is they? Is it the investigators? Is it the participants? We don't know. We can guess, of course. I'm sure many of us in the audience would probably guess that it's the participants. But should scientific writing have this ambiguity? No. Scientific writing needs to be objective, clear, have no ambiguity at all. So do avoid these types of pronouns, of course. Instead, we can simply write in this example, the participants. We also want to be careful when using qualitative words, especially when describing quantitative data. Some, most, about, few. Why are these problematic? Well, again, I think let's look at an example. Few of the participants experienced adverse events during the study. Now, if I was to conduct a poll today and ask our audience to tell me how many is few? I'm sure some of you might say, Harry, I think few is around 1%. Some of you in the audience might say, I think few is about 15%. Again, we don't know. We're having to guess. We have, again, a level of ambiguity. Scientific data should be more clear. So instead of using qualitative words such as this, simply state the quantitative number, six participants. Also the relative amount, the percentage can be useful for your readers to interpret how significant this would be. Another type of word that we should be mindful of using are subjective words. For me, these are words that are opinions surprisingly, interestingly. Remember, something that's surprising to you might not be surprising to somebody else. Overall, I recommend that academic writing is objective. Conclusions based on facts. Findings based on the data presented. We don't want our academic writing to be overly subjective. In general, though, my recommendation is to use these types of words sparingly. Myself, I do use these words, but maybe once or twice in a manuscript. At those points where I really want to emphasize where something is interesting or unexpected. It's almost like having those words in bold when we use these types of subjective word. So do feel free to use them, but just be mindful to use them sparingly, as overall scientific academic writing should be objective. Okay. Well, I'd love to keep talking you talking to you today, as this is one of my favorite topics, actually, but we only have a small amount of time today. But I would encourage you to please keep in touch. My email address is here, harry.shirley at springernature.com if you have any questions related to today's content but also anything related to publishing please do um, get in touch with me and you'll also see my uh, my LinkedIn here you can just add me on LinkedIn by searching Harry Shirley and I, I'd love to keep in touch so that's it from me today thank you so much for the invitation um, to speak today it's been a pleasure Thank you, Harry, um, for that really useful uh, section. Um, just a reminder to everyone that the Q&A is still open, so please do submit any questions that you have for our speakers today, um, and we will be answering questions at the end. Um, I will now pass over to our third and final speaker for the day before we go on to the Q&A session. Um, so over to you, Wafa, to, for your part of the webinar. Hello, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So uh, my talk would be, we'll focus on just tips, some useful tips, uh, which might help um, um, to publish your work. Um, the peer review process is just, it's, it will never be a, a barrier to publish your work. It's, it's just the evaluation of, of the work um, done by the researcher 
by similar uh, competencies as a, as the proof of uh, as the the the, the work the research of themselves. So uh, to provide basic quality control, so the the, the the publisher would like to make sure the quality of your work is uh, is at the standards of their uh, journals, but also it's relevant and the the research is important, uh, and also they need to assess the novelty uh, of of the work. Uh, so these are the, the points that I want to discuss um, with you is uh, to increase the chance of, of uh, your, um, to be, of your, uh, of your publication. Uh, so know your challenges, I think, is the most important thing. So uh, we need to focus uh, on the aims. Uh, so you need to focus on the aims of your research, uh, but also think about the audience, who will be interested in, uh, in your research, who will be uh, interested to publish your research. So you might think about which journal you might, uh, you might need to publish in. Uh, also, you have to be aware of the current work and policies. Uh, um, you need to make sure you, the research you want to conduct uh, fits within the current gap or the current interest in your area of interest. Um, and make sure you articulate, sorry, articulate your idea within the current uh, gap or interest. I know that, so for example, myself, English is not my first language, it's my second language, so writing in English might not be an easy, so you might think about um, finding academic um, English um, course, writing uh, in academic English, so I know there are some uh, free uh, online courses run by, I think, Oxford and also Manchester, so uh, you might enroll of, in one of the academic writing courses and um, think about reading some of the manuscripts, the, 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 the papers already published, think about their structure and, con and content and um, the cost of publications. If you're not working in an institute or university, you might need to pay to, uh, for, for, for publication, but also the time you might spend in writing um, down uh, your research results. Planning uh, your research, if you want your work to be published, you need to plan ahead for that and make sure your research uh, proposal is uh, precise. So you might think also about your, uh, the team you want to work with. Uh, you need to engage uh, your team, make sure they're interested to help you in, to publish your work uh, at the end of your research. Uh, start with uh, a precise and good proposal. And as a researcher, we might need to write a proposal for different reasons, for example, to apply for fund or for a research post. But try to write the proposal with, with the thought of the manuscript, the future manuscript, so because you might need to use part of your proposal later on to write the manuscript. And, and the proposal is the blueprint of your research, so it's good to start with a strong, precise proposal and with a as an, a, a, as an author, the research questions must be precise and also the aims and objectives of your research. Keep it simple, so as um, Harry said, just make, keep it simple always in terms of writing your research, but also make sure the research, your research, the research questions and research aims fit the current gaps and current interests. So you find someone who's interested or some uh, journal will be interested to um, publish your work. For example, in dentistry, we always, all publishers will be always interested to make sure uh, they, will, they would accept any research which might link to patient care. So even if the research is in vitro research, if it's linked to the future patient care, uh, it will be more um, popular and more accepted. Try to make sure your aims and objectives um, offer solutions uh, to a current problem. Um, maybe start with uh, by, by finding a couple of journals you're interested in in the future. So if you started your research now, try to find a couple of journals um, and try to keep reading papers from those journals so you'll be familiar with their structure, with their aims. And, and also you might uh, choose key, two key papers, for example, with high citation, uh, written by known experts. And as a researcher, those key papers will help you find the best way to conduct your research 
also it will enhance your ideas and you will learn from those experts. But also as an author, you'll be more familiar with the genre format um, uh, and the genre language. Uh, you will know more about the structure of manuscript. Different journals will have different structures. Um, and also you might find more studies from those key papers, which you might use um, in your um, future uh, manuscripts. Uh, I would advise also to study the specific journal peer review process. So each publisher will have um, details of their peer review process. So if you look at it in advance, and you'll be more prepared uh, to, uh, to, to submit your work in the future. Um, the, the, the journal manuscript submission guidelines, every publisher will have uh, the manuscript submission guideline in their website. And if you spend some time trying to access those links and read about the specific journal um, guidance, then that will help you in the future to write your uh, manuscript. I would advise also to write as you go. So don't leave it until the end. So from the point of writing the proposal, you might think about which section of your proposal might be suitable to be incorporated in that future manuscript. And um, think about the title of the publication you want to publish. Um, maybe that can be extracted from the aims and objectives of your work. That might be a research question. Uh, so think about what title you would choose. You might start writing the material and the method early on from the start of your research. Um, and then you build on uh, that manuscript as you go. I wouldn't advise you leave it until the end of your um, research. Uh, proofreading your work, if, if English is your uh, second language, uh, then you might need to re read it and reread it. And we might become insensitive to our mistakes. So, give it to a friend, a native speaker, or maybe um, someone whose English is uh, good. To read it by a second person will be um, a good idea and to receive some feedback. Also, you might send it to a proofreader or uh, proofreading services. There are many online um, which offer a um, proofreading service. Uh, then you might want to, at this stage, to revise the manuscript against the specific journal guidance or um, author guidelines, just to make sure the structure you're using is similar to the, the, the guidance from the journal you're trying to submit to. You might think also after proofreading it to give it to an expert from your team, from your university or outside of your research team, just to have a look and maybe receive additional uh, feedback, trying to respond to any feedback and don't be offended, just try to improve. Any feedback will help you improve your original manuscript. Make sure before you submit your work, it's strictly following the instruction to author guidance, which, as I said, available in every publisher website, uh, because that might be a reason for rejection uh, if you don't follow it strictly. Um, and then wait maybe 12 weeks until you receive um, their uh, reply. Um, Reasons for rejection usually is a poor study plan or poor study design, I mean. Um, and that's when the proposal is, that's why the proposal is really important. So writing your proposal um, and make sure it's precise and robust will help, will increase your chance of future uh, publish, publishing. You might receive minor or major correction. Um, so that's not a rejection, but uh, they're asking you to add more information maybe. So you will receive a letter, so try to follow the reviewer comments one by one and try to strictly apply um, uh, their suggestions. If you can, then you just have a clear justification of why you can't change uh, or you can't make the changes they're asking for. And um, write clear and concise response to the editor and the reviewer comments. And there's a, What's on, what's on the screen is a paper written by uh, an author, and which will explain uh, how you would write um, a response to editor and reviewer. Um, so this, these are examples. So try to respond to each reviewer comments and 
um, reply to their uh, suggestions and make changes uh, and show exactly where the changes uh, in the manuscripts. Try to resubmit, don't be offended if they just reject your work. You can always improve it, respond to feedback and just resubmit your work uh, or maybe consider another um, uh, journal. So hopefully this is uh, helpful, Lucia. Yes, that was really great. Thank you, That's Wafa. Yeah, welcome. Great. Um, thank you to all of the speakers. We will now um, move on to the Q&A session. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Um, some are more general questions. Some are specifically for one of the speakers. Um, but I will keep them open to the whole group. Um, so please do feel free um, to jump in at any point. Um, one of the first questions, which uh, specifically is for David, um, and David, I think you've said you'd like to answer this question live. Um, the question is, who can I contact regarding interviews with researchers? At Durham University, we have established an amazing Ukrainian dimension in all initiatives of the university, and we would love to talk about it. Good. I think he could reach out to me directly. Um, I'll put, is my email contact on any of the webinar programs? No, but we will. Um, we can share all speakers' email addresses. Yeah, Those please do. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you for for that, Igor. Um, I, yeah, please contact me directly, and we'll uh, we'll be in touch. We would like to interview some of the colleagues from the Ukraine here in the UK. Um, so I, please do that. Great. Thank you, David. Um, I think this question is probably for Harry based on his presentation, but I'm sure that all speakers could probably touch on this. Um, one of the participants has asked, sometimes we find ourselves forced to use longer phrases to avoid repeating and to link ideas. How can we keep the word count minimum in this case? Great. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the question. It's great that you bring that up because, yeah, I, I do agree. We do want to avoid um, repetition in our writing. So sometimes we might want to reword um, a, a phrase or reword um, the way that we're describing something. It's really about fi finding that that balance. As I say, on average, I recommend sentences between 10 and 20. It doesn't mean that sometimes we can go slightly longer if it means that our writing is going to be more readable, more interesting. So really, it's about you finding your own style as well. Um, so, you know, there's no there's no there's no um, magic a number that I can give you today for sentence length. There's no magic formula for, for writing any manuscript. It's really about what's right for you and your study. Um, but yeah, in general, my advice is, is to try and keep things concise. But of course, there, there's room there for, for maneuvering. If, for example, you want to use a slightly longer phrase to add variability to your writing, then that's certainly something you can consider doing. Thanks so much for the question. Thanks, Harry. I don't know if uh, David or Wafa, you wanted to touch on that. I know Harry's answered that well, um, but if either of you want to. I would, it's just a point I would make, but I think if somebody understands something really well, they can communicate it very quickly and in short, simple ways. And I think Sometimes I think I think Waf has made the point too. If English isn't your first language, this can be a difficult thing. And so I think you know, trying to have somebody you work with who's expert in the language who can provide constructive feedback, uh, I think that's a very good thing to do. I know my first few papers, I had a very strict person who <laughs> they would cut things down. We had to do presentations that would only last eight minutes, you know, to get across that. So these were good disciplines to do, uh, really to get you thinking what you really needed to say. Great, thank you. I could perhaps um, direct this next question to you, Wafa, um, which leads on quite nicely from uh, your presentation. Um, somebody has asked regarding the academic writing courses that you mentioned in your, um, when you were speaking, 
how do how can someone enroll onto such courses? Um, are they online? Um, and perhaps you could maybe mention if you personally attended any academic writing courses and how you found them beneficial. Yeah, of course. So um, I'll share the screen just for my uh, hopefully I'll find it there. Yeah. Um, so these, if you search in Google, just um, academic writing courses, there are several, all of those are free courses. So the one on Coursera, for example, um, they're all free. Uh, so writing, academic writing in English by the University of California. Here in Manchester, we have um, uh, a nice um, uh, link to academic writing phrases. So you can always, uh, so I'll try to send you the link, Lucy, and might send it later to the, uh, to whoever interested. But all of the courses there, the Open University is free courses. So you can just enroll online. Uh, they might take time. So for example, uh, the, this, that, this course might take up to six months, so three to six months. So you have um, several um, Presentations you might need to just uh, listen to, and then you have some work, um, uh, self learning work you, you need to, to do uh, in between. Uh, so, I recommend. So, I had this course before. Also, there is one in Oxford University. I couldn't find the link, but I'll try to send it to you, Lucia, if I found it. Uh, and I, we have here in Manchester um, academic phrases uh, link, which will help you. For example, find synonyms to different words, academic synonyms. So it's really um, really good. Hope that answered the question. Yes, definitely. Thank you, uh, Wafa. Um, this is probably a question um, for all speakers um, about how you can identify predatory journals and how to avoid them. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, uh, Harry or David, Waffle. whoever wants to go first, please. Um. Yeah, it's a tricky, I mean, I think the answer is to really talk to your academic supervisor about which journals are best for your article. Um, the, the, I, I think I can speak for Elsevier here is that we do not produce a list of, I mean, there are some journals which are totally predatory and uh, you know, charge you a lot of money for publishing your article and don't send it out for peer review at all and you don't get any feedback. Um, that's not really anything you want to do. And um, I think ideally you want to send your article to a, to a place where you're likely to get high quality peer review and good feedback. And usually the best person to do that would be uh, your mentor or academic supervisor. They will tend to have a relationship with a particular set of journals, not, not with a given publisher, I should say, um, at all. But um, I think it's not, it, 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 there is no definitive list, is there, Harry? Of, of, um, because it's such a range, you know, there are, there are, there are some that are, that are just totally, um, you know, take your money and, and don't post your article at all, right through to some that are, uh, where you might get the editor looking at the journal, but you don't get any peer review, uh, which again is not what anybody wants, really. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's best to uh, avoid any any lists. There have been lists made in the past. There's Beale's list, but these these aren't frequently updated, and there's a lot of. Um, uh criticism of, of of some journals included in lists and some being excluded etc um some things i would be mindful of if a journal emails you directly asking you for a submission be mindful this could be a predatory journal this is how they market themselves they send out thousands of emails um as david's alluded to really they want your money as as quickly as they can get it so they may ask you for um, um, a, a fee before you even navigated the peer review process, which is quite unusual. If a journal is aligned with a well-known publisher, Springer Nature, Elsevier, it's not going to be a predatory journal. Um, look at the editorial board of, of, a, of a journal. Do you recognize anybody? If not, then this could be a predatory journal. 
Uh, also, is the journal indexed? Is it indexed in Web of Science, Scopus, etc.? If it's not, then this could mean that it could potentially be a predatory journal. But um, kind of as we've already discussed, the, the predatory journals are just there to make money. So if somebody is asking you for money uh, at a strange point of the submission process, perhaps far too early on, then this should ring alarm bells for you. Great, thank you both. Um, we have time probably just for one more question. Um, and Wafa, this one can probably be answered by you, um, given that English is your second language. Um, somebody has asked, how can I improve my English at the university to be more professional as English is my second language? I understand it very well, but find it hard to speak and to explain myself. Again, it's just going to several. It's, it's sometimes it's difficult because uh, just make sure you're involved with native speakers as much as possible, um, especially in scientific meetings. For example, try to be involved in journal. If there is any journal groups like um, um, we have here, for example, in Manchester, um, a journal club. So if you can join any of them. Um, Go into courses, try to listen to English, like um, online courses, I think uh, might be good. TV, try to listen to a lot of TV. But if you're not in that like environment, just with try to be involved with more, with more native speakers, um, and that hopefully will improve. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Wafa. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time for more questions. Um, I will just share my screen for one last time. Um, so I would just like to thank uh, our esteemed panel. Um, thank you to all three of you uh, for today. Um, it's been great uh, to hear you speak and to have you all share your knowledge on this topic. Um, and I would also like to thank all of the attendees for your time and for your questions. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar uploaded onto the Inspire Europe Plus website. Um, and hopefully some of the presentations from the speakers will be made available. Um, the resources that were mentioned today throughout the webinar will also be made available following uh, the webinar. For those who registered for this webinar, you will also receive a di direct link to all of this via email. Um, before we end, I just want to share some upcoming events with the Inspire Europe Plus project. Um, on the 8th of December, so on Thursday this week, there will be a webinar for host institutions on remote fellowships for researchers at risk. This is primarily targeted at host institutions, but researchers at risk are more than welcome to attend. And we would ask that you share this with your colleagues in your host institutions who may be interested in learning more about this. And finally, how can you get involved and connect with the Inspire Europe Plus project? One way is to join the mailing list. Um, this is where you will find Inspire Europe Plus events and activities. This is where they will be shared. You can join this by visiting the SAR Europe website listed here. And you can also email inspireeurope at mu.ie. You can also find us on Twitter and LinkedIn where events will be shared here as well. Um, so just a final thank you um, to David, Harry and Wafa and to the participants for your excellent questions. Um, we would really welcome your feedback on this webinar. So as I've mentioned, we will pr be providing a short survey in the next few days. Next few days. Um, and yes, thank you so much to everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Have a lovely rest of the day.